only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? If you want to find people who are studying God's Word, come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 the Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, watch A Word from the Lord Thursday nights at 9 o'clock right here on WGSR. I couldn't stay in Johnny at first. I thought he was a nut. And once I read the Bible for myself, I'm able to accept the truth now. All right. And it doesn't make me angry. I'm talking about the Lauren Hardy show on Wednesday. Don't worry about them, some y'all. Get off of it, would you? Don't dare do that again. Shut that up. Shut that up. Shut that up. As your pastor, I am telling you, please, don't waste your time on Wednesday nights watching this television program. If you're looking for Laurel and Hardy, I left my derby and I left my cane, but I did bring my Bible. If you'll read along with me, you'll find that the persons who are making the accusations, they're really the ones who have a problem. I hear them telling you to shut up, that you're going to be embarrassed, and I even hear them flat out saying, I'm telling you what to do as a pastor. Give me a chance and I'll give you what does the Bible say. Always ask for what does the Bible say. Get it right here on Star News. New time, Thursday nights at 9 o'clock. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. Good program uh, previously. What does the Bible say? And as we always say, if you'll just ask, what does the Bible say? You'll always get a word from the Lord. So here's our contact information, as always, to let you know how you can reach us if you're in the Eden area. We meet at 250 The Boulevard, 276-340-2653 is my cell number. Or you can call 336-394-5721, and that is a way to uh, get a phone that will reach uh, it'll be an office phone. And uh, you can leave a message there, and I'll get back to you just as soon as I can. And, uh, but we will certainly be glad for you to come and visit with us and, and uh, examine the uh, Word of God uh, with us, we meet at uh, 10 and 11 o'clock on Sundays and 7 o'clock on, on Thursdays. And if you would like a Bible study any other time during the week, we'd be glad to come out and do that. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me uh, by way of email. If you're in the Martinsville area and the Danville area, 823 Starting Avenue in Martinsville and 120 American Legion in Danville is the way you can uh, find brethren there again. Uh, at 9 and 10 o'clock on Sundays is a, is a good time to, to find them, as well as on Tuesday nights in Danville and Wednesday nights in Martinsville and then Thursday night in St. Eden. So you can go, you can go to Danville, Martinsville, and uh, Eden and uh, find us all, all together. We'll be studying the, uh, God's Word together in any of those places, and you'll be welcome to ask questions and examine uh, God's Word with us. Tonight, I want to begin by simply letting you know some things that uh, were stated in a discussion that I had with uh, uh, Mr. Lewis at the First Wesleyan Church in Eden. Uh, I met him at a mutual place, mutual home there in Eden uh, a couple weeks ago, and we had uh, a discussion. And he asked, or I asked him if I could call him sometime and we could have a, have a Bible study just on our own. And he said, yes, that'd be fine. So I've given him a call. He's not returned my call. So I'm hoping that, that uh, he has just not gotten around to it. But I intend to get in touch with him again. Uh, and uh, he seemed to uh, be willing to have a discussion. But, you know, I don't want to uh, evil surmise. But it seems that sometimes that is more of a... Uh, courtesy answer than it really is a, uh, a commitment answer. Sometimes people just uh, say that just to, um, you know, move along. I hope that's not the case with Lewis. But nonetheless, we did have a, a Bible discussion and uh, for about an hour in these uh, individuals' homes, and uh, I thought it went rather well. Uh, I stayed around and talked for about another hour to the, uh, uh, to the couple, and uh, I thought we were going to have another Bible study, which I still hope to uh, have that with them. But I believe that it is the case that uh, Lewis is afraid of what the Bible actually says. Tonight I want you to hear some things that he said. 
I, I have it recorded, but I told him I wouldn't record it. But I will quote from my notes, and if there's any discrepancy with what I'm saying, if I'm misrepresenting him in any way, we can always play it uh, if he uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so chooses. If he will call in and let us know if he thinks something is wrong, then we will certainly be glad to clear that up and just play his own words back to him, which we're glad to do. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to goad him, but I would like to have a discussion with him. And I, the reason why I'm bringing out what he says is because I believe neighbors and friends that many people believe the same thing that Lewis believes. And it is a problem that it is a pro it creates a problem later on when you try to find out what the whole will of God really is. And so tonight I want to uh, start off by simply saying some things or letting you know some things that Lewis has said in our discussion. So this is what Lewis the, we the Wesleyan church preacher says. One of the things that we were asking was simply about salvation and he said a number of things that I know many of you will agree with, but yet are contrary to the Bible, or at least not so much contrary to the Bible as at least they are um, twisting the Bible, or at least not making the Bible reach its full potential. When the Bible says the sum of God's word is truth, it creates a contradiction when you, but when you take doctrines that are not fully uh, 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 grounded in the uh, uh, are not fully grounded in uh, uh, God's word. So, here's one of the things that was said. Lewis said that you're saved by faith. Now, I know many people believe you're saved by faith, and when they say saved by faith, they mean saved by faith only. Now, we had some discussion about saved by faith only, and at what point were you saved? Now, Lewis said you're saved by faith, when we pressed him about saved by faith only, you know, he admitted, well, yes, there is some repentance there and there is some confession there. But you see, the problem is the Western church believes that you repent and then you believe. Well, that creates a problem. You're not saved by faith only, obviously, because they believe that repentance is essential. But this is the verse that Lewis directed us to when he, when he wanted to sum up his argument, and it was Acts 15 and verse 9. Acts 15 verse 9 says, Acts 15 verse 9 is where Peter and the apostles are discussing whether you uh, must be circumcised in order to be saved. And this is what uh, the conclusion was, Acts 15 verse 9, that God put no difference between us, the Jews, and them Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, I don't have a problem with that verse. That verse does not do any kind of damage to what we teach. The problem comes when individuals believe that purifying their hearts by faith is purifying their hearts by faith only. You see, faith in Acts 15 verse 9 has to include something more than just uh, faith or belief itself. It has to include other things. Now, most people in the religious world, most of you watching tonight would say, Yo, well, yes, uh, you know that there are other things that are involved in a person's salvation and that purifying their hearts by faith surely will have to mean something else. Repentance, confession, something else, at least something else that's added to faith. It's not faith only. As a matter of fact, the only time you find faith only in the Bible is in the book of James where it says you're not saved by faith only. It's not faith only. Now, friends, we have to recognize that when a preacher or anyone else tells us Acts 15, 9 is the, uh, the, the plan of salvation in a nutshell, there's something amiss. You can't leave out the other things that the Bible says are connected to your salvation. Acts 15, 9 is not a... A, a one verse wonder when it comes to salvation. But we couldn't get Lewis to, to uh, explain much more than that. We couldn't get him to explain much more than that. We ask about, we ask about baptism. At what point do you contact the blood was the question that was asked by one of our brethren. And this is what Lewis said about 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. Let's put it up here on the screen for us. 1 Peter chapter 3. Whoops, 3 and verse 20. 
and 21, starting here, starting at verse 21, it's where he says, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, listen, here is what we were told. It's not the putting away the filth of flesh. It's not simply being, being bathed in the water. That, that is what we believe. We don't believe that it is simply a washing of your, your body. It's not the outward washing of your body that saves. It is something that takes place on the inside when you are baptized. But yet you can't deny that baptism doth also now save us. That's what the Bible says. But for some reason, for some reason, our friend the Wesleyan preacher had a problem with saying that baptism was part or essential to salvation. He went on to say, or he said, he stated that baptism is something that takes place after you're saved. Well, if baptism takes place after you're saved, then why in the world would Peter say baptism does also now save us if baptism is what is, comes after salvation? Look, the, the, the parenthetical phrase here, not the putting away the field of flesh, but the answer of good conscience of God, is something that you can take out and put at the end of this verse. It is simply a parenthetical phrase. It's, a, it's an additional thought. Look, put it this way. The life figure wherever, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it's something you must participate in in order, in order to have salvation. That's what Peter says. But Lewis wouldn't uh, uh, expound upon that very much. But nonetheless, we asked him about it. We asked him about it. He yet to give, a, he yet to give us an answer. And hopefully this is something we can discuss more. How is it that baptism doth also now save us if it comes after you're saved? We've yet to understand that. But this is another thing that Lewis said. We talked about calling on the name of the Lord. And he said calling on the name of the Lord is talking to the Lord as if in a prayer. And then the old verse, the standby verse that so many people quote, Romans 10 verse 13, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, friends, I want you to, to listen carefully. We, in the church of Christ, who are preaching the pure, unadulterated word of God, do not deny that a person is saved by faith. We do not deny that baptism, that baptism is for the remission of sins, that it is a, a part of salvation, 1 Peter 3.21, nor do we deny that your person must call on the name of the Lord. What we want to know is, what does calling on the name of the Lord mean? Paul tells us in Romans 10, verse 13, calling on the name of the Lord is obeying the gospel. Look, Romans 10, verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he says, how shall they call unless they believe? And how shall they believe it if they haven't heard? And how shall they heard without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them that have preached the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. If someone's going to call the name of the Lord, they're going to have to hear something and then believe something, and it's going to come after someone has preached to them. Verse 16, but they all, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Calling upon the name of the Lord is obedience to the gospel. And we find the same thing in Acts 2 and verse 21 when Peter says, and it shall come to pass, whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. What must a person do then to call upon the name of the Lord? When the people who heard Peter asked the question, what must we do in verse 37 of Acts 2, Acts 2 verse 37, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. It was salvation after baptism just as it was salvation after repentance. Repentance and baptism are connected by this word and, they had to do both. Yet we didn't get an answer from Lewis, a satisfactory answer from Lewis, about calling on the name of the Lord in the same context that Peter put it in. That was being obedient to the gospel, repenting and being baptized. And so we're still wanting to know something about what a person must do to be saved and we would like to hear the Wesleyan perspective of it. But here's why I bring this up, friends. 
Here is why I bring this up. It's because the problem that our friend Lewis was having and the problem that so many people have is that, that when they look at these verses, they, they don't take into consideration that they're all connected together, that they're all connected together like a chain. And so tonight, I want us to look at a chain. I want us to look at the chain of salvation, whereas we, we look at the sum of God's word. The psalmist said in Psalm 119 and verse 160, the sum of thy word is truth. If we don't look, if we don't look at God's word in a all-inclusive manner, that is, if we don't look at the word of God as a series of everything has to fit together in order to uh, achieve the common desire, we will handle the word of God deceitfully. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 1. Paul says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But having renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. If someone tells you that a part of God's plan of salvation is not essential, they're handling the word of God deceitfully. If someone tells you that you can be saved not doing what God says is part of the equation, they're handling the word of God deceitfully. We don't want to be that way, friends. We want to give you the sum of God's word and help you to see that everything that God includes in man's salvation or the salvation equation is connected together like a chain. And if you take one link out of that chain, then you have broken the salvation chain. You can't have salvation without the whole of God's word, the whole counsel of God is what we're dealing with. Look at this. What we're going to look at is we're going to notice a number of things that are connected to salvation. And as we go through this, we're going to find the Bible says that all of these things are part of man's salvation. What I would ask you to do is tell me which one is not essential. Which one of these links of this chain that we're going to be pointing out, which one, which one is not really essential? Which one can you take out and still have a complete chain? Let's start at the beginning. Salvation comes from God. Isaiah 12 and verse 2, he talks about God as his Savior. God, our Savior. Certainly God is the Savior of all mankind. He is the one who originated it. He is the one who designed it. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, notice what the record says. For therefore... We both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all mankind, especially of those that believe. Now, does that mean that there's some individuals that are going to be saved even though they don't believe? Or there some, is there some that are going to be especially saved because they believe? Do they get a double portion of salvation because they do believe as opposed to those who don't believe at all? Can someone be saved without believing? No. But it is the case that God has made a plan of salvation and thus he is the savior of all mankind. He's made it possible. But he ultimately he is the savior of all those who will believe. How do we know? Because in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the Bible says that the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. God has given or made it possible for man to partake of eternal salvation because he, he, it, he is the originator of, God, of man's salvation. And he's put in place a number of things that must be connected together in order for man to be saved. It'd be nice if we could just stop right here and say God has saved all mankind. Let's just go home. But that's not the case. For notice this. Man is not only saved by God, but specifically saved by God's love. In 1 John 4 and verse 10, notice what the record says. 1 John Chapter 4 and verse 10. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be our propitiation for our sins. God is, is uh, our Savior and His love is what directed man's salvation in Christ Jesus. He sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sin. If we come down to verse 19, John tells us, 1 John 4 verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. You and I would not have the hope of salvation if it weren't for God's love. I know everybody knows John 3, 16. 
is that verse that everybody pulls like a dagger when they talk about what a person must do to be saved. And they say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It does not say that everyone will, will uh, be saved simply because they believe, but a person should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's love has provided a plan of salvation, a means of salvation, wherein man might be saved if they will be obedient to him. God uh, committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, verse 68. So tell me, is a man saved by God? Is God, is God man's savior? Yes. But, God, but God's love is also a link in the chain of man's salvation. Why? Because God's love is what sent his son, and it is God's grace, it is God's grace that makes it possible for man to be saved. Look, here's another link in the salvation chain. Titus 2 and verse 11, Titus tells us that it is the grace of, the, the grace of God that bringeth salvation, that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. God's grace is what brings salvation. Now you say, a man saved by grace. Yes, but not grace only. It is God's grace that brings salvation. It is God's grace that makes salvation possible. No man can be saved without God's grace, but no man is going to be saved by God's grace alone. If it were the case that we're saved by grace alone, then we would say, well, we're, we're saved without God's love because God's love is part of man's salvation as well. See? In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, the, uh, again, another very familiar verse, a very favorite verse of individuals who try to get around uh, all the key ingredients or all the key links in God's salvation chain, like to quote this verse, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath Perp, uh, hath ordained, uh, hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Listen, friends, we're not saying that you're saved by grace only, nor are we saying that you're saved outside of God's grace. But look, you're saved by, saved by grace through faith, that not of yourself. If I do something that God tells me to do, part of God's plan, it's not of my works. It's not of my works. I don't devise a way to be saved. I'm simply telling you that God has put the plan in place that if a man will be obedient unto his will, God's grace will save them. God's love will save them. They will be saved by God the Savior through his love and through his grace that put the plan in place. But it's not grace alone, nor is it faith alone. See, God's grace and his love and his mercy are all part of these chains. Titus 3, verse 5. Notice again, Titus 3 and verse 5. And again, I ask as we go through these, ask yourself, which one of these is not essential to man's salvation? Which can we just do without and say, well, we're still saved? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. See, here we have, we have another piece of the puzzle, another link in the chain that shows man just what is involved in his salvation. Here's the chain. It has to do with God's mercy. God saved us by his mercy. Now, no one's going to say that those are unessential. But the reason why we're pointing them out, friends, is because it is this clear. There are a number of things that the Bible says are connected to your salvation. If you take one of them away, the chain's broken. If you take one of them out, you make null and void the strength of this chain. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. <clears throat> no one's going to say that you're not saved without God or His love or His grace or His mercy, nor can you be saved without Christ. In Matthew 18, verse, uh, verse 11, here's what the, what the Bible tells us. Matthew 18, verse 11. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Now, I don't know about you, friends, but I don't know of anyone who's going to say, tell us, 
that they're saved without, without Christ. I don't know of anyone who can, who, who's going to tell us that they're going to be saved with, uh, without, without Christ, that Christ came and it had no bearing on whether we were saved or not. I don't know of anyone to say that. I think everyone's going to say that, yes, we have to be saved with Christ. Christ is a, is a key link in this chain. But yet, we, we recognize we can't have the chain without that. But you know what? As we come on down, there are going to be some links that somebody's going to say, well, that's not important. That's not essential, is it? Which link is not essential? Is this link not essential? What about Christ's death? You see, the Bible says we're saved by God, God the Savior. We're saved by His love. We're saved by His grace and by His mercy. We're saved by Christ. Specifically, we're saved by Christ's death. In Romans 5, verses 6 through 10, a verse we uh, referenced earlier, but notice this. We're saved by His death. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being not justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son... Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We're saved by the death of Christ, much more by the resurrect, his resurrection from the dead. It is Christ a key element in a man's, in a man's salvation. Anybody going to say, deny that that's essential? But look at this. Again, specifically, you can say, well, I'm saved by Christ, but we're also saved by his death and by his blood. Ephesians 1 verse 7, we have redemption through his blood. In Acts 20 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul says that we are saved by his death. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. It seems to me that without the shedding of Christ's blood, there is no remission of sins, nor is there any salvation. No one denies that. Everybody seems to say, well, it's not the water, it's the blood. Well, you know what? I don't deny that. I don't deny that the blood of Christ is a key link in the chain of man's salvation. But I want to say it's not any more or less important than God or His mercy or His grace or His love or Christ or Christ's sacrificial death. It's not more or less important. It is all just equally important because without this link, the chain is broken. Which link so far can you take out of the equation? No one will take a link out because they know that breaks the chain. But look at this. As we go on down, we find also that salvation is in the authority of Christ or in his name. Notice in Acts 4, verses 10 through 12, Peter tells us that it is salvation in the name of Christ, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. Verse 11, this is a stone which was set at naught by you builder, of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for, the, for there is none of the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No one has the authority or the power to forgive men's sins except Christ. In Matthew 28, verse 18, as Jesus was going to give the Great Commission, he said, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. That is why it is by the name of Christ that a person must be saved. We have to believe that he has the authority, that he has made it possible for a man to be saved. John, 10, John 20 and verse 30. Listen to what John says. John chapter 20 and verse 30. John says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. It is through the, the name of Christ or through the authority of Christ that man has the has the hope 
or has the even possibility of having eternal life. Can you take away this link out of the chain and have it still be a solid, strong chain? Can man's salvation exist without Christ? No, it can't. But you know what? Christ and God are not the only links in man's salvation. Notice this. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11, the Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, here we go. Paul says, for, for such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Justified, sanctified, and washed by the Spirit. It is a Spirit that washed, sanctified, and justified. Just if I had not sinned, sanctified, set apart for the cause of Christ, and washed from your sins all by the Spirit. The Spirit is a key element in this chain. Now, no one's going to say you're saved by the Spirit alone. Any more than they'd say by the saved by Christ alone or by God's mercy alone. All of these things are connected together. Now, again, why are we saying this? Because the discussion that we had with Lewis from the Wesleyan Church failed to realize that all of these things are connected to man's salvation. God is on one end reaching out a chain of salvation and all of these are linked together and without one you don't have man's salvation. So far, can you find any link that doesn't deserve, doesn't belong? Can you find any link that should be taken out or could be discarded and said it's not really essential? It's the weak, weak link in man's salvation. You can't because they're all part of it. And look at this. The Holy Spirit directed men to bring God's plan into a written form. They were guided by the Holy Spirit, Paul said, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and following, they were speaking the words of God as the Holy Spirit speaketh or teacheth. These words are the Spirit's words. They guided men into all truth to reveal God's plan for man. Thus, you have the Spirit as a vital link in man's salvation, but also you have the gospel. That's why Paul says in Romans 1 verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why? Why is the gospel a part of man's salvation? Because it tells man what he must do to be saved. When someone tells me, when someone tells me, friends, that that they can be saved, I want to know where it is in the Bible. If they tell me how they're going to be saved, I want to know what it, where it is in the Bible. You know why? Because this book is the only book that I know of that tells about man's salvation. It's the only book that talks about the Holy Spirit of God. It's the only book that talks about Jesus and what he did for our salvation. It's the only book that talks about God and tells us about his love and his mercy. So when someone tells me that this book is not important, I question whether they even know what salvation is all about. It is the gospel that tells us of man's salvation. It is the gospel that is God's power to save. When someone tells me they're saved in a way that's different from this book, that tells me they're saved differently than by the power of God. Because Paul clearly says right here that the gospel is the power of God to save. Can God save another way? He could. He could have saved another way, but he won't save another way because this is the power of God unto salvation. It's the gospel. You tell me you were saved in some other way, shape, or form other than what you read about in this book, and you're a liar, friends. You're not saved. You are not saved unless you can find the way you're saved in this book because this is the power of God to salvation. That's just, that's just how important it is. If you tell me you're saved another way other than the gospel than what's in the book, then you're going to tell me that this is a link that's not important. But you see, the gospel is a key element in man's salvation. Why? Because it tells about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 through 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Now, we, uh, sorry about that, 1 Corinthians 
15, verse 1. Now, when we asked, <coughs> when we asked Mr. Lewis about this, he said, well, you have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The gospel. Believe in the gospel. Okay, don't deny that. But my question then is, how do you obey the gospel? Because look what Paul says. He said, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, the gospel which is God's power to save. He said, which also you received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. Saved by the gospel? Yes, that's right. Saved by the gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. They had to believe what Paul preached. If Paul preached, uh, if, if they didn't believe and they didn't abide in or stand in what Paul preached, they're going to be lost. Friends, when you come up and tell me that you were saved by saying the sinner's prayer and it's not in this book, you tell him you are saved in a way that's different from the gospel. Paul didn't talk about it. Paul didn't tell them to keep in memory that they were saved by the sinner's prayer. It's not there. He said you believed in vain. You were saved by the gospel, he tells the Corinthians. He says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, now he's going to tell what the gospel is, I, uh, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for your sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and then of, of the twelve, and after that he was seen above five hundred uh, uh, brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So he preached unto them the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. That is a, as a key element in man's salvation. No one's going to say that that element's not that essential, that, that that change's not essential. But look at this, friends. We have to realize that in, in the chain of salvation, there's a lot more links to uh, man's salvation than what many people believe. And that's the point I'm making. When people say, well, you're saved by faith and that's it, you're leaving out a whole lot of links. Listen, the Bible tells us that we're saved by preaching. In 1 Corinthians 1, in verse 21, what does Paul say? I'm going to come back to uh, 1 Corinthians 15 in a moment. But look at this. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them to believe. You mean to tell me somebody can be saved by preaching? That's exactly right. Because without the preaching of the gospel, no one would hear the gospel. And if no one hears the gospel, they won't know how to be saved. See, in Acts 11, verse 14, Peter had to come and tell Cornelius words whereby he would be saved. If the word wasn't preached, then salvation is not reached. Peter had to tell someone words so that they could hear it, and know what to do to be saved. Thus, you're saved by, the, by preaching. Now, if someone wants to say you're saved by faith only, I'm going to say, well, how do you even gain that faith? How do you gain that faith unless you hear the words of the gospel that produces faith? You see, faith only eliminates all things in the chain of salvation, including the gospel that produces the faith that they say is so essential. But the Bible says you're saved by preaching. Saved by God, the Savior, saved by His mercy, saved by His grace, saved by His love, saved by His Son, saved by His Son's death. We're saved by Christ's blood. We're saved by the preaching of the gospel. We're saved by the gospel, saved by the Holy Spirit that, brought, that sent the gospel. And thus we're saved by the preaching of the gospel. And we're saved by the word that you hear when the gospel is preached. Listen, James tells us in James 1 verse 21 that we should receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save our souls. Look, the word is able to save your souls. Now, can you tell me that it's not essential? Can you tell me that it's not important? In 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 11, the Bible says, For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I say it's essential that you believe the truth, that you believe the gospel. It'll save your souls. But believing something other than this book, friends, will only lead to sure damnation. This is a vital link in man's salvation chain. The chain of salvation certainly is connected by, by the word. But notice this, friends, you have an obligation 
to that word, you can save yourself. Acts 2 verse 40. With many other words did Peter exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now, are someone going to tell me, is someone going to tell me that you don't have a part in your salvation? You know what, friends? If you believe that God has to give you belief and God grants you repentance and God saves you by himself and you do nothing in your salvation, if you believe that you have no part in your salvation and that you do nothing to remain saved, then why are you here? What's your purpose? And why would Peter tell these individuals to save themselves from this underworld generation? It must be because they have a responsibility and obligation to act upon what they've heard from the gospel that was preached to them. The gospel that was directed by the Holy Spirit for the apostles to preach the Holy Spirit that Christ sent to guide them in all truth, Christ who died on the cross, who shed his blood, who was sent by God because of God's mercy and his love, who planned before the foundation of the world to save mankind. You see how the chain reaches? It reaches all the way from the throne of God all the way to the hearts of man. But you know what? We're not through. This chain's not through. Because you have to save yourself. How do you save yourself? What is, what is so uh, essential to saving yourself? Well, it has to do with obedience. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9, Christ became the author of salvation to all that will obey him. Those who will obey the gospel, Romans 10 16, which you've already read. You see, you save yourself by being obedient to the gospel. How are you obedient to the gospel? How do you obey the gospel? Well, look at this. Here's, what, here's how you're obedient to the gospel. In... <clears throat> In the Bible, you find that individuals have to hear. You have to be obedient to hearing the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It was by the preaching of Peter that God chose to save the Gentiles when they heard the gospel. Acts 15 and verse 7. Now, friends, can you tell me that hearing is not important? Hearing is a vital part of man's Salvation chain. If you take out hearing, the hearing of the word that produces salvation, that produces faith, you break the chain. But God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and, uh, uh, and be saved. Hearing is important, just like it is believing. You see, faith, the link that everybody focuses on, is not the only link in the salvation chain, friend. Belief is something that you have to do. Save yourself. How? By believing. When you believe, when you profess, I believe Jesus Christ under God, you've done something. You've done something. Yeah, you've done a work. And faith is a work. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Faith is a work. John 5, 28, 29, it's a work. And thus you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. What do we believe? We believe in Jesus Christ. Purified your hearts by faith, certainly, but not faith only. Cornelius, Cornelius was told words that would produce faith. Look at this. In Acts 10, in verse 43, Peter tells them to get that his job was to give, uh, to him give the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall have remission of sins. But not at the point of belief. Not simply because you believe, because there's other things you must do in order to be obedient to him. Like what? Like what, James? Well, let's look. See, the Bible says that faith is connected to repentance. You cannot, friends, you cannot repent before you believe. Now, I know a lot of you Baptist friends out there, and the Wesleyan Church teaches it too, that you repent before you believe. There just ain't no way. There's just no way that you can repent before you believe. There's just no way. Look at this. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please Him. You can't please God without faith. Now, is repentance pleasing to God? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. You can nod your head. You know it's, you know it's pleasing to God. So please tell me, 
how you're going to please God by repenting when you don't even believe yet. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You don't have any knowledge that you need to repent and turn to God unless you believe first, unless you have faith. Acts 11 verse 18, Acts 11 verse 18, that's exactly what happened. Cornelius and, and the, uh, the Gentiles that Peter uh, went and preached to were granted repentance unto life by God. But not before they believed. Not before they heard the word and believed, but yet repentance is very vital to their salvation. It's a link that is, is necessary to chain because it's what God commands all men everywhere to do, Acts 17 and verse 30. God commands all men everywhere to repent. So it's vital to man's salvation. So is confession, Romans 10 and verse 10. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now up to this point, Everybody's saying, you know what, that, that's right. You know, all these things are in a, in a line. These things are all linked up. God, his love, his mercy, his grace, Christ, his death, his blood, salvation uh, are all connected with these things. The Holy Spirit bringing the gospel, the gospel that tells the man the good news, the good news that man must then obey, save himself through obedience. All of these things are essential. How do you obey? You hear the word of God, you believe it. You have repentance, and then you confess it. And at this point, everybody goes, well, you know what? That makes sense. But wait a minute, friends. You see, in the salvation chain, there's still another link. There's still another link that so many people say, well, it's not essential. But for some reason, the Bible thinks differently. Peter said in 1 Peter 3.21, a verse we read at the beginning, whereunto baptism doth also now save us. If Peter says baptism is part of the vital length of man's salvation, why do you want to take it out? Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. See, if you don't believe, you're not going to repent, you're not going to confess, you're not going to do anything. Because you can't please God without, without faith. But if you really have faith, you'll be baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. They're both connected together. I still would like to hear how the Western preacher would like to explain this to us. Man is saved by baptism into Christ because it's baptism for the remission of sins. See, all these are linked together because here's why. Baptism, baptism puts us into Christ. It puts us into Christ where salvation is. In Acts 2 verse 47, on the day of Pentecost, those that believed were added, uh, those that were saved were added to the church, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now tell me, friends, which link is not essential to man's salvation? I, t I submit to you that the church is just as a vital and essential link to man's salvation as is the blood of Christ. I know that because the blood of Christ purchased the church. The church is just as important to the blood of, to the uh, salvation of man as is God's mercy or his love. Anything that we've talked about, friends, is important. It's essential. And you can't, you can't say, well, that's not essential. That's not necessary. See, what we've seen, we've seen man being saved by all of these things, by God, by his love, by his mercy, by his grace, by his son, by his son's uh, blood, by his son's death. Saved by his life. We're saved by obedience. We save ourselves. We say we're saved by hearing. We're saved by believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized into Christ where salvation is. Now, does anyone want to deny that these are important? Go ahead and put the phone lines up. We've got a little bit more to go, but I want you to see so far, friends, that the link cannot be broken. The chain cannot be broken. You take one of these links out and you've broken the chain. You say one's not important? Well, look at this. The Bible tells us that we're saved by being faithful. After we have achieved salvation in Christ, we still have obligations. We still have to work. We still have to be faithful. And yes, we have to work. Jesus says in Luke 9, 62, Whoso put his hand to the plow and looked back is not worthy of the kingdom. So we've got worse to do. <clears throat> works of faithfulness.
You're on the work from the Lord. Welcome to the program. Yeah, James, I got a couple questions. I want you to be honest about it. Well, you think I'm going to lie to you? Sir? Do you think I'm going to lie to you? Well, I want to know, uh, you and your wife still together or she walked out on you? I'm sorry? Are you and your wife still together or she walked out on you? Yes, me and my wife are together. What does that have to do with what we're discussing, sir? So you, so you ain't having no trouble? What does this have to do with our with our discussion tonight? I'm asking you a question. Is she I'm answering with your you? question, sir. I, my I wife and I are happily married. Now, why do you why do you why do you want to know? <laughs> I can tell you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. You're on the way from the Lord. All right. Uh, I was calling concerning these churches. People people is, is really confused about these churches. It's a real church. Our body. Church that's the Messiah's, uh, that's the church that really matters. Can you turn your TV down just a little bit? Because <clears throat> Paul said, he said that you Can you turn are, your TV down, please? Paul said, he said, I'm a master builder. And he built upon the foundation. And the foundation that he built upon is what we must go along with today. And people taking these churches, putting all types of names on them. And they really getting confused because when he come back, these buildings are going to be destroyed by fire. He said, he, so he, when the, the fire he talking about is our body. He said, any man built upon that church is going to be tested with fire. And that's temptation. When we go to hear a preacher, he give us spiritual things and he feed our body, which is the building. And that building is going to be tried by fire, which is the lust of this world, to see if it's going to stand. Okay. Real so, church. That's why he said, no, you're not. These churches, okay. people got posted up because he said if two or three got them my name that I am in the midst of them. Well, well, wait a minute. All right. So when he said that, when he said where, where two or three are, I'm in the midst, he's talking about in retrieving or restoring an erring brother. But let me ask you this. If, I mean, what, what church then are you a member of that, you know, do you, do you worship somewhere on a regular basis and, and where, and where is that? I worship the most high in truth and in spirit. All right. But where, where do you worship on the first day of the week? Or do you worship on the first day of the week? I, I, I don't. I, I worship Sunday through, Friday, through through Saturday. No day. I put no day above another. So, hey. so everything you do is worship? No, I don't. I don't. I don't worship every day. Well, well, the Bible says when you when you when the church is come together in one place, that that's when the church is supposed to worship. Now we can worship uh, on a daily basis, but I'm talking about as a collective body. Yeah. Where where do you worship with the, with with the church when it comes together in one place? Well, we we'll, as far as going to these churches, I don't go. Like far as these buildings, I don't go into these buildings. You, you, you're not you're not a, you're not a member of any of these. No, I'm a, groups? no, I'm a, no, no. Far what I'm what I'm about to say is this. I got what, what I've learned is from is from brothers all around the world. See, we're not all together as in one, but we all in one body, which is the Messiah in heaven. So right now, that's my church. I'm in his but, body. He but, is but in are you, so you're, you're a part of all these in, churches out here? His body. No, no, not these churches. I'm talking about brothers that know this truth, and we're in this truth, and we all... But where do you work? The Bible says the church of the New Testament worships on the first day of the week. Where do you worship on the first day of the week with all the other like-minded brethren? We, we don't we, we worship by, by meditating on this word and staying faithful. That's how we work. We worship together where, like where that. Where do you assemble, though, sir? That's what I'm asking. I got brothers. Like, I got brothers. It's brothers, like, say a brother in New York somewhere. No, I'm not talking. I'm talking about in this area. The brethren in this area who are like-minded, who have fought, who believe the same doctrine you have. It's, it, this is, it's, where do they worship? I had to say, it's not a, this is not a wide gate. You said this is a sir, straight gate. And, be the sir, you where, where, where do you worship? Go walk this sir. Way. Sir, where do you I worship? Walk it by yourself. Do you not do you not assemble anywhere on the first day of the week? No, it's there's, there's Okay, all right. That's that's what I want to know. If you don't assemble on the first day of the week, I know that you're not a member of the church that you read about in the Bible because the Christians in the in the first century, they assembled on the first day of the week in one place. All the saints in that particular area, they they assembled in a place so they could worship God. The church came together in one place. Acts 11, I mean, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14. Just read through there. They came together in one place. And if you tell me that you're, you didn't assemble in one place with all these brethren, with your brethren, then I know right then, I know right there that you are not 
uh, part of the church. You read about the New Testament. So, you know, let's, that, that's what we need to consider. You want to word from the Lord? You're on the air. I'm on the air. You're on the air. Hey, uh, bro, James, how you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, I got a question for you. Okay. Um, it's not pertaining to your uh, study tonight, but I'm having trouble trying to find something. Okay. And uh, what I'm trying to find is, um, where in the Bible does it speak about uh, giving them their flowers where they live. Could you tell me where I can find that at? Giving flowers where they live? Yeah. Honoring them with the flowers where they live? Yes. Uh, don't know. Giving them flowers, where, honoring them with flowers where they live? Uh, uh, I don't know. I'm not, I may be wording it uh, the wrong way, but I know I've read it in there and I can't find it. The Bible says it. give people honor where, uh, give honor where honors do. Well, then it says something about gives them the flowers where they live. I don't know. I don't know. I would, uh, that about? I, I would say uh, get your concordance out and just look up the word flowers and see what you come across. That's what I tried and it's, I couldn't find it. Well, either either you're looking up the wrong word or it's not in there. I, I've never heard that. Ver- I've heard of give people you know give people flowers while they're alive. In other words, honor them while they're alive, while they can appreciate it. That's what I'm talking. But about. I don't, I don't know that that's in the Bible. That I mean that may be like a, a biblical principle, but it doesn't say those exact words. Well, I read that in the King James Version. I read it, but I just can't find it. Okay. Right well, I I don't know. I, I might find it some other time, but off the top of my head, I don't know. Sorry. All right, thanks for your call. Hello. You on the word from the Lord? Hello, James. Hey. This, this is Hazel Carter. I'm going to cut my phone. And I wanted to call you and tell you that this is one of the best services that I have ever seen preached on this, and it is so plain. And I'm 77 years old, and bless God, I hope to make it till Thanksgiving. I'll be 78, and I've been hearing the Word of God preached all this time, James. And if people can't get it right from what you <coughs> spoke tonight, they won't never get it. Okay. You are really... I, I look for you to come on. It says evangelist. I'm a member of a Baptist church and I have been for years, but I've been sick and I've had several operations and I have been able to attend there, although I, my donation is given between me and my husband there. Well, so well, that we will, you know, have a time to give God. Well, well Ms. Hazel, but, where, where, do you, where, where do you live? What, what city I live you... at Brosville. At Brosville? And they bed a lot on the kind of being sick now. Well, would you like for somebody to come visit you? Well, not right now. Well, uh, I mean, I, we, would, we would love to. I will later on, honey. Okay. Because let me tell you, I'm saved down in my heart. And everything that you cannot be saved without all you got up there. Well, but Miss Hazel, let, let, let's let's think let's think together. We got just a few minutes left. Okay. But, but let, let let's think together. I know you said you're in the Baptist church. Yeah. Now, well, see, I don't I, I don't even go over there anymore. I, I know, but here but here's my point. I look for the well, word of God okay, from a man well, like you that I've heard well, tonight. Okay. Well, let let's let's we got we got just a few minutes left. So let me let me just put something in your mind. Let me let us think together. Yes. We've been talking about this chain. Yes. All the things that are connected to man's salvation. Now, right. we've been talking about you can't take a link out or you break the sal- you break the salvation chain. Yes. But what if you Maybe put it? I'll what, get better where I can at the but, end. But, but what if you what if you put a link in? What if you add something to it? See, the Bible says don't add to, you nor take add away. away. Now, my, now listen, Miss Hazel, Miss Hazel. Yeah. If you if you add to it's, the link, if you add the Baptist Church to the link. I don't then need you, that because I'm not going in there anymore. Okay, but see what we need to do is we need then, if 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 we're going to kick out the Baptist Church because it's not there, 
Yes. Then let's let's become a member of the of the Lord's church. Yes. That's, that's what I'm wanting. That's what I'm going to do. I am a member of the Lord's church. That's why I listen to you. Well, I love that, you, that's James. what I'm saying. I, I'd like to I'd like to know for sure so that we can say you know. You pray for you, me, James. I will. I will, Miss Hazel. Please. And I I, I would I'm I would love you. to. Can I can I get your number and call you sometime? You you have really you've really uh, made it so plain that even a baby could understand this. Well, can I get your number and call you sometime? Yeah, my number is. Well, don't, don't get rid of it. Just hang on a second. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. No, I, I'm going to put you on hold and somebody, okay. somebody's going to get it for you, okay? All right, then. All right. I, God bless you. All right. Thanks for your call. Thanks you're for doing. Calling. I always love to hear you. All right. Well, good to hear from you. Good to hear from Bye, you. Bye, baby. All right. I'm going to put you on hold. Okay. It's line four right here, Brandon. Okay, friend, we're, we're, we're running out of time. We're, we're going to stop on that call. That was a, a very good call. But I want you to realize, friends, all of these things we've been talking about are essential links to man's salvation. And if you take one away, you take one away, you've broken the chain. Most people don't want to be baptized for the remission of sins. No Baptist preacher is going to tell you that. The Western preacher is not going to tell you that. The Methodist preacher is not going to tell you that, but the Bible will. Why? Because the Bible is telling you the chain of salvation. If you would like to copy this program, just let me know, 276-340-2653, or email me at wordmanlord at gmail.com. Till next time, friends, remember this. If you ask what does the Bible say, you'll always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night. I couldn't stay in China at first. I thought he was a nut. And once I read the Bible for myself, I'm able to accept the truth now. All right. And it doesn't make me 